Hey friends, I feel like a lot has already happened in this hour of worship. And we still have the opportunity um, to hear a word from the Lord. Um, first, though, I'm going to talk about American baseball for just a moment. Um, I do want to acknowledge um, we have a number of Ukrainian friends and guests here today, so we're so glad for your presence. Um, a woman named Katerina is going to help with our closing song. Um, a wonderful singer. Um, so maybe American baseball still seems strange if you're a first generation or um, American. There's a particular baseball player who, when I was a kid in the 70s and 80s, was like the hardest working baseball player out there, a guy named Pete Rose. He played initially for the Cincinnati Reds, then the Philadelphia Phillies a little later on. Um, he is, to this day, the all-time leader in hits in the Major League, 4,256 hits. He played more games than anybody else, 3,500 games. He made 17 all-star appearances at five different positions. Infield, outfield, the guy worked hard and could play anywhere on the baseball field. He was known by this nickname when he played, Charlie Hustle. I wish someone would call me Charlie Hustle. Like the guy just threw his body all over the field. He ran so hard, he worked so hard that even um, when he was walked, he would drop his bat and sprint to first base as fast as he could for a walk. Because he knew that once you're on first base, something good might happen from there. Maybe the catcher drops the ball. Maybe they just ignore the fact that you're running to first and you can run to second. But from first base, all things are possible. If you are a kid or a young person, I commend this part of Pete Rose's example to you. Like if you hustle your way through life and if you just, if you get to first, if you can find the platform from which things are possible in life, you always want to get there. I know it's not cool to be the first one in class, but know what happens when you're the first kid in class? You get to build a relationship with your teacher, and your teacher is like, wow, this kid cares a lot. When I was a kid, I loved music. I would be the first one in rehearsal. I got so much free advice and counsel and affection from my band director, my orchestra director. Can you imagine what would happen even on a Sunday morning if you were the kind of kid who was like, I'm going to be the first person in my house that's ready for church on Sunday? Do you think your parents would be like, what is wrong with you, kid? Just stop it. You're making the rest of us look bad here. It's not cool to hustle, but hustling actually puts you in a good position for good things to happen. Pete Rose got this right. He got a lot of things right. And then in August 1989, which was his last year as a baseball manager, he was found out and then penalized and has been made permanently ineligible from participating in anything related to Major League Baseball because he was charged with betting on baseball. Did you catch that? I know it seems weird because there's like sports betting advertisements like around the clock these days. And this is a guy who is one of the all-time greats in baseball. And because he bet on baseball and the teams that he either played for or managed not to lose, only ever to win, but still he is permanently ineligible. I would make the case that even though Pete Rose hustled his whole playing career to first base, he forgot in his later years, what was most important. Because there can be no game without freedom and fair play in competition, and his actions compromise that. I'm not here to render any opinions about Pete Rose. I kind of think there should be forgiveness for the guy. That's it. This summer, we're going to talk about the things that distract us, that pull us down, that keep us from running to first as far as God is concerned. Here's what I know. Not just in baseball, but in the life that God gives us. If we run to the place 
where God can meet us and greet us, where we can experience the presence and the power of God. If we keep running to the, that place and hustling to that place, we give God maximum freedom and opportunity to be at work in our lives. And we are wise, no matter what age we are, to keep professing our play, faith and keep running to that place so that we can meet the Lord. But friends, there are so many things that would slow us down, weigh us down, bog us down, distract us. The list is endless. And when I say first base, God gave us 10 commandments in the Bible. And the first one, if I can call it first base, is just this. If you would read the words in yellow. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. That's actually Exodus 20. Apologize. This is the first commandment. No other gods before me. What God did in the book of Exodus was absolutely revolutionary in the history of the human race. Before the book of Exodus... There was never an unknown, no-name group of slaves who were recognized, set free, exalted, and recognized. That had never happened before. And then God broke in. Second, revolutionary idea. Before the book of Exodus, every human being in the ancient world assumed that there were many gods you played, prayed to one God for rain. You prayed to another God for long life. You prayed to another God to hopefully bless you with grandchildren or children. You prayed to another God to grant you success at work. And now for the first time in the history of Homo sapiens, God himself speaks and says, you know what? This assumption that all human beings have been running around with in every corner of the world, I am the one true God. Israel had been in Egypt. Have you ever been to the Egypt exhibit at the Museum of Science and Industry? History Museum? Egyptians had so many gods. There was Osiris. There was Ra. There was Nut. Crazy name for a god. Anubis. And God says, you've been living in Egypt for 400 years you no-name people who have been slaves to the Egyptians, who have been working on pyramids and bricks and mortar, and now this. I am the one true God, and instead of being a no-name people, I am going to call you by my name. These ideas were so earth-shattering and groundbreaking that God did amazing things to verify them and allow them to sink into our collective consciousness. God literally parted the Red Sea so that his people could walk through. Just like he had to like create space, part the way in our very souls so that this reality can get into us. God supplied his people daily manna and quail to feed their souls so that these new things that he was giving them might actually land and take root and take up residence in their hearts and lives. And then God brought them to a mountain in the wilderness called Mount Sinai. And together, this whole group of once no-name people stood at the foot of the mountain and together as a community, as a congregation, heard God speak. It's one thing to get a bunch of no-name people out of Israel, out of Egypt, rather. It's another thing to get the Egypt out of those no-name people. Do you hear me on this? This is still our dilemma today. It's one thing to get people out of slavery in Egypt. It's another thing to get the slavery out of us. But this is God's project. God made himself declared himself to be Israel's God. This relationship that the people of God have with God, it's not that we gave God a People's Choice Award. It's not that we had an election and voted God to be God. It's that God initiated this, that God set a people free, that God gave a people a name, that God spoke 
And this relationship built on God's kindness and grace and freedom giving goodness came to the whole human race. God's business is to set people free. He sets us free. And at the center of this free community is God himself. Once more, let's read these words. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. That little phrase, I am. I am the Lord your God. That is the central revelation of the Old Testament. God giving his name. And it's not a name like Steve or Terry or Nut or Osiris or Anubis. God's name literally, Anaki Yahweh is the Hebrew. God is the one who is, he is pure life. He is the alive one, the free one, the life-giving one. That is his name. Life and energy and goodness through and through. It's contagious. And God is speaking in the plural here to his people. I am the Lord, y'all's God, who brought y'all out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I'm sorry, in English, we don't have a, like, a second-person plural pronoun. But then this amazing thing happens. God's revelation flips out of the plural and then says to each member of the community, person by person, in the singular. Again, the English does not pick up on this. You, in the singular. You, Bert. You, Don. Don't have any other gods beside me. You might be thinking here in 2022, what does this all have to do with me? This not having other gods? Because like 3,000 years ago, you could worship the Egyptian gods. You could go to the pyramids. Maybe if you've been to Sunday school and you know a little bit about the land of Canaan, where the Israelites were going, you know there were gods there like Baal and Ashtoreth and Molech. And occasionally the Israelites would get duped into like praying to Baal for rain praying to Asherah for their farming success. And it wasn't so much that they set aside the one true God altogether. They just wanted the God who set them free from Egypt and the extra bonus of having some gods on the side, kind of like a contingency insurance plan. And even all these years later, we may not be tempted to build an idol out of wood or stone, But which one of us would not like a contingency plan? For if God God does not bless us or help prosper us or allow us to succeed in the way that we would define our own life's blessing or success. Wouldn't it be great to have a policy? A backup plan? All of these backup plans the Bible has an ugly word for. It's right there in the first commandment. It's idolatry. And this word, I stand before you as a fellow idolater, okay? Because I am the kind of person, even though I'm a professional Christian and I love Jesus very much, and I am trying my best to organize my whole life around hearing his voice and being obedient to him, but I have found thousands of ways to be an idolater. And I look across a congregation of beautiful people, and I see a group of broken idolaters. (laughs) Okay? I'm sorry. I love you, but this is who we are. So what is idolatry? This is a Reformed church, and there's something called the Heidelberg Catechism that gives us kind of short, pithy, biblical answers. This is what the Heidelberg Catechism says idolatry is. What is idolatry? Please read along. Idolatry is having or inventing something in which trust in place or alongside of the only true God who revealed himself in his word. Sorry, we have a typo in that one too. Okay. Idolatry is anything in which we would put our trust in place of 
or just alongside of God. Last week's message was brought by one of our elders, Sam Hamstra, and he put it this way. We pray to a God who fixes things, who heals things, who mends things, absolutely. And we pray to the God in devotion when things cannot be fixed. We still pray to that God. We still come running to that God, even when something is so broken that on this side, it is not going to be made right. Here is the constant temptation, especially when you know that something is not going to be made right anytime soon. It's to find a contingency plan, a Jesus and plan. We're going to spend the rest of the summer in sermons naming our favorite American idols and trying to shine the light on them so that they're displayed for what they really are. Maybe good things, really good things, maybe helpful things, maybe great gifts, but they are not the one true God. Here's just a short list of things that I have fallen for. Sometimes when things are hard, I like to do things that kind of numb or distract my own emotions. I love playing golf, but sometimes if I can't figure something out, I'll just go play golf for a couple hours so I just don't have to deal with my own life. Netflix is a great way to numb yourself. There are an alarming number of substances which a person can use to have this effect in your body and your mind. Uh, The internet offers untold ways from pornography all the way to compulsive online shopping just to crawling through Facebook. I mean, maybe just for five minutes because you need to catch up and then all of a sudden 90 minutes later, you don't even know what you were up to today. Anybody ever had this problem? I fall for the idol of success as I define it again and again and again. As if my sense of identity was primarily hinged to the health of this congregation. That is not a good plan, by the way. Perhaps you've fallen for this, that your main identity is built on your personal competency or what you're getting done or how much money you made this year or if your bonus was bigger than it was last year. Some of us fall again and again for our favorite news channel or our favored political group or identity. As if red or blue were somehow more definitive than our connection to the one true God. Aren't these bad things? I mean, they're all good things. Aren't we bad people? I'm such a bad person. And amazingly, Jesus loves me so much. And you. I have fallen for the idol of my own nuclear family. It almost sounds unchristian to say that. Like, of course, we're called, I'm called to love Sarah, love our children, sacrifice for them. But sometimes in dealing with stuff at home and obsessing about that, I actually lose sight of how big and beautiful the family of God is, the people, you included, that God set free, that we are under the banner of his own name, and that my own genetic and blood relationships will be fleeting and brief compared to the amazing family and kingdom God is creating. Love your people, but there's something even more. I have fallen for the idol of my own comfort, that when I'm sick, or when things are really, really wrong, that, oh God, if you just, if you just made this all right, I would love you so much. And then when he does, it's like getting healed from a cold. You feel so good for half a day, and then you just like go on with your life as if you had never been sick before. I have fallen for the idol of power and influence. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm a pastor. I'm never going to be in charge of too much stuff. But we do, if you work for a church, like have a little bit of influence. I just came from a nine-day denominational meeting where we were all under the delusion that we were somehow changing the world by being together with like 200 church bureaucrats. Isn't that funny? 
take it so seriously. It is significant, but it is not life and death. It is not the kingdom of God. It's just one tiny little corner of a denomination. Has anybody ever fallen for any of these things? God bless you. And then there's this one. This is the last one. There is the idol of influence or strong arming so that I get my way or wielding of power, imposing my agenda in a way that allows me, thank you very much, to be God and denies God his rightful place as the one whose will is and ought to be done. Basically, this is what idolatry boils down to. To make ourselves and our agendas into little gods rather than letting God be God. We can do this individually. We can do this as a church. We can do this as a nation. And this happens in the community of nations. If ever you detect a situation where some kind of idolatry is happening... It is the Holy Spirit's constant whisper to us to put it in the back seat and run back to first, the place where good things happen, the place where we honor no other gods but God alone. So it was just maybe 115 or 120 days ago that the Russian army crossed the Ukrainian border and there has been war on this planet. There has been a land war in Europe ever since. Um, I feel free to say this here in the state of Illinois in the United States of America, but my guess is we are in common consensus in this room that that is an unjust act. That whenever presidents or princes or prime ministers try to accumulate so much power that they are willing to wreak havoc, sacrifice innocent life, to accumulate or take what is not theirs. That is not the will of God being done in this world. Vladimir Putin is not the only person who has ever done this. If you page through human history, it is a sad litany of one nation after another, one king or queen after another, one people group after another, just accumulating their own power or will at the expense of others. How are we ever going to turn from our warlike ways? How in 2022 is there going to be peace? Of course, we talk. Of course, we send our diplomats. Of course, the mighty people and nations get together and try to come to agreement. But there is no lasting peace in this country or any other where God is not God. It might, there might be temporarily, but it will be brief and fleeting until we as the children of God recognize that God is God and put away all of our secondary idols and amendments and insurance policies and Jesus ands and simply let God be God. How does a person do this? How does a community do this? Unlike Pete Rose, the way to get there is not just by hustling. It is not by trying hard. The spiritual mystery of how to actually allow God to be God is to do what Psalm 46, verse 11 says. Be still and know that I am, there's his name, God. I am not trying to heap an extra burden on you this morning, brothers and sisters. I'm not telling you just to hustle like that great baseball player in the past. I am saying that the solution for all of our idolatries is not trying harder, not presenting a better version of ourselves, not being the best Christian boy or girl on the block. 
It is actually being wise enough to know that we are, as John Calvin said 500 years ago, that the human heart is an endless factory of idols. That's a humbling statement. An endless factory of idols. And that the solution is not by concocting more things, but by resting and allowing God to be God. And so for this nation and for the Ukraine and for Russia, let it be our collective prayer this morning that we would find the wisdom to be still and know that the Lord is God.